Lectures on Greening Legacy Cities, presented as a collaboration between the Lincoln Institute and the Future of Small Cities Institute. My name is Jessie Grogan. I'm the Associate Director of Reduced Poverty and Spatial Inequality at the Lincoln Institute and manager of our Legacy Cities Initiative. The Legacy Cities Initiative, launched about 18 months ago, aims to equip leaders of legacy cities, particularly small and mid-sized cities, with the information, tools, and connections they need to revitalize their places equitably and sustainably. We do this by releasing research, like the work that fed into this webinar, which will be re released later this year. We also have tools like an interactive map of legacy cities and data snapshots, as well as case studies of innovative policies and programs on our website, which you can find at LegacyCities.org. Finally, we offer opportunities for legacy city leaders to learn and network. In addition to web webinars like this, we will be seeking members of our next community of practice, where we'll work closely with teams from four cities over 18 months, including support for staff time to work on a key project for city revitalization. This will, the call for cities to participate will come out over the summer. We're also rolling out a new program where we work closely with key stakeholders in a city to better help them integrate transportation and land use planning through a series of discussions and workshops. You can learn more about these upcoming opportunities as well as uh, be notified when the report on greening smaller legacy cities is released by signing up for our newsletter, which you can do from our website, again, legacycities.org. For a little bit of webinar housekeeping, uh, those of you who joined a little bit earlier will have seen, we have disabled the chat function for this webinar. So we're asking people to address their questions, both technical concerns and questions to the panelists through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Now with that, I will pass the virtual microphone to Rafe Larson, founder and director of the Future of Small Cities Institute. Rafe. Hi, Jesse. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a real well, privilege to be here and so excited to be teaming up with uh, the Lincoln Institute on this really important series. Um, Future Small Cities, I saw some of you weren't familiar with it. Uh, we're based in upstate New York. Um, and like the Legacy Cities Project at, um, at Lincoln, we, we, we uh, look at the kind of challenges and opportunities that are baked into particularly small cities, uh, the small industrial, post-industrial legacy cities um, as places where we can do innovative work in sustainability um, and, and inclusive sustainability, which is why I'm so excited to hear uh, some of the groundwork that groundwork has been doing in, in, their, in their cities. Um, one of the issues that comes up in small cities, as many of you know, having worked there is capacity, right? Capacity, capacity, capacity. Everyone's doing 65 things at once. So the kind of deep embedded, uh, community embedded resilience work uh, takes a lot of capacity and it takes a lot of onboarding. Uh, so uh, Groundwork is just doing some of, the, some of the kind of cutting edge work in that, in that regard. So I'm really excited to see how we actually do this on the ground. Um, our first uh, webinar, which you can find on the Future of Small Cities, um, website was on um, with a sort of background for for the green inventory project and we looked at Ithaca as a case study and their sort of decarbonization plan where they're trying to electrify and decarbonize buildings at a wide scale um, and looking at some of the strategies we did that we also heard from da Dr. Catherine Tumber who um, <coughs> is a, is worked on this report and uh, and um, you know is kind of one of the the godfathers or godmothers of, as it were of of looking at small uh, legacy cities and from a, a sustainability perspective. So very excited to be awesome. here. Um, and I'm gonna introduce our MC for the, uh, for the day, um, the famous Joe Schilling, uh, who is a senior policy and research associate in the Research to Action Lab and Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute. It's a mouth, mouthful. Over the past decade, Joe has worked with local leg legacy city leaders from Youngstown and Cleveland to Flint and Detroit, cultivating innovative green regeneration strategies from greening vacant lots to housing preservation and strategic code enforcement. In 2020, he and co-author Gabby Velasco completed a Lincoln Institute working paper, The Green Inventory Project, which I'm sure, sure Joe will talk about a little bit today, um, which explores pr promising sustainability plans, policies, 
and programs in small to mid legacy, mid sized legacy cities. Um, and a lot of their work has been really influential for me um, thinking about what different generations of sustainability planning looks like in these small and mid sized cities and what are some of the barriers to having cities move towards that uh, elusive third generation of, uh, of uh, sustainability planning. So I'm sure we'll hit a, hear a little bit more about that, but take it away, Joe. All right, thanks so much, Rafe. And thanks, Jesse and the whole Lincoln team for hosting us. Before I pull up the slides, I think what's important to reflect is what next week is Earth Day, right? And it seemed at that point when we think of sustainability, Earth Day was a strategy to really expand our exposure to uh, the environment, try to reconnect. You know, it led to a lot of initiatives like you know, recycling, um, which are all great when it comes to helping you know, the sustainability of our communities, but we now face an entirely different set of challenges with climate, uh, equity, and of course, economic recovery. Uh, so we're having to take a lot of these issues to the next level. And that in some ways, as we reflect on our own sustainability journeys, whether that's as an individual, as a local government leader or uh, a state and federal government uh, perspective is that each of these different actors along with community members and business leaders play critical roles along the sustainability journey for a community. So what's been great for us here at the Urban Institute is the partnership with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy to really explore in more depth the regeneration of legacy cities, particularly the focus on small to mid-sized cities and how sustainability, climate resilience and equity can help serve as really a catalyst uh, for their regeneration. So our game plan today is I'm gonna provide a little bit of an overview of our Green Venturi project. And then as Jesse and Rafe just explained, we're gonna really roll up our sleeves and uh, get an insight from the Groundwork USA Network and Groundwork Elizabeth as to how they have been tackling the issue of climate and equity and resilience uh, at that neighborhood scale. So that they're, hopefully this, this seminar will really give you some kind of tangible strategies uh, to helping do that greening on the ground. So I will share my screen. So the work that we're doing uh, in partnership with Lincoln is what we call the Green Venturi Project. And so this, as you can tell from the slide, has been our own sustainability journey. So we started with a scan, Green Venturi 1.0. And our goal was really to understand what's going on out there. What are small to medium-sized legacy cities doing when it comes to sustainability? So we created not a comprehensive, but really a snapshot inventory of a variety of initiatives, plans that local governments have adopted in these cities, policies, programs and also projects. What kinds of projects were they doing in their communities that started to look at this interesting opportunity around greening and sustainability? And then that led us to doing a little bit more of a synthesis. Um, that was the Green Venturi 2.0, which is a working paper uh, that you can uh, Google on the Lincoln Institute of Land Policies website. And there we started to kind of dig a little deeper, kind of put the focus a, a little clearer as to, well, we understand what they're doing, but, but why? Why are they doing this? How are they doing this? Kind of exploring a lot more depth, uh, some of the nuts and bolts behind these different policies and programs. And then as uh, Jesse mentioned, 
um, with my co-authors, Gabby Velasco here at the Urban Institute and Catherine Tumber. We're now in the process of pulling this together in a policy focus report for Lincoln, sort of our Green Ventory 3.0, which is to try to put this into context and more of a sort of policy agenda uh, so that leaders at all levels of government and, and their nonprofit partners can better understand what some of those core ingredients are. And our theory of change is, I think, optimistic, and it's also quite simple. What we're really focused on is if you have sort of green and equitable policies, plans, programs, projects, and practices, what we call the five Ps, uh, that they can really serve as this catalyst for the revitalization and regeneration of smaller to mid-sized legacy cities. And I put up uh, Catherine's book, Small, Gritty, and Green, because it was really part of our inspiration. When Catherine wrote this book about 10 years ago, we were kind of early stages of our sustainability understanding about the role and the, the potential and promise of America's smaller, older industrial cities. And now, in some ways, with the Green Venturi project, we're re-examining that, particularly when it comes to some of the current pressures that local governments and communities are facing today. So one of the insights so far is that there really is this policy evolution uh, when it comes to what local governments and communities are doing. There are sort of first generation sustainability policies and plans, brownfields redevelopment, the greening of government operations. And then we see cities kind of evolve and become more sophisticated and expansive. So maybe they put in place a full-time sustainability manager. Uh, maybe they're starting to integrate some of the different policy domains. So it's not just recycling, but it's looking at green community development. And then this third generation, which in some ways for a lot of legacy cities, particularly smaller ones, is more aspirational. They've got a couple of the key components, but they haven't quite made that pivot from second to third generation. But we see those cities, particularly the larger sustain, uh, legacy cities uh, or midsize like a Providence, or a Richmond, Virginia, or a Cincinnati, where they now have full-time sustainability coordinators or directors, and they're elevating environmental justice. And so this, what I call sort of this third generation sweet spot uh, in policy domains is where you have a focus on climate resilience, green economic development and environmental justice. And that all three are really co-equal components to this regeneration strategy for smaller uh, legacy cities. A key component from what we've found so far in our work is this pivotal role of intermediaries, green intermediaries. They can be found at all levels. There are our national associations, well known, like the National League of Cities, that has specific cohorts around climate and resilience. You can find state networks, the sustainable state networks, where you have a number of state organizations, some housed at local universities, that certify municipal operations uh, in a kind of a sustainability. Uh, uh, rubric in order to kind of give them a grade as to how sustainable are the programs and policies of various municipalities within those states. You have regional entities. I just list one here, which is the Mid-America Regional Council in Kansas City, where they provide some capacity for the municipalities in their jurisdiction and guidance through the, the development of a regional sustainability plan. Uh, you have professional associations like the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Uh, and then you have local 
entities like Rusta Green out of Cornell University that, you know, again, provides support to a number of upstate New York's communities. So what we see is this pivotal role of green intermediaries that provide capacity, they provide technical capacity, strategic capacity, and also work as a network in trying to both sort of connect communities and policymakers, uh, and again, help them move towards this intersection of third generation policies and programs with climate resilience, equity, and green economic development. And that brings us to our focus for today, which is Groundwork USA. And Groundwork USA is one of, this, of these green intermediaries that we discovered during our uh, research. Although I have to confess that I discovered Groundwork USA a long time ago during the early days of the Brownfields program when we started doing case studies of the Groundwork Trust Initiative in the UK. And some of those case studies then led to the birth of Groundwork USA. And now this network, as we'll hear from Cade and John, are working with communities and neighborhoods, often underserved neighborhoods and youth, and infusing these notions of sustainability, of climate resilience, of equity, and also putting those communities on the path for economic prosperity as well. So that's our focus today. Hopefully you have a little bit more context about our program and project, but let me introduce Kate and John. So Kate Minoga, Mingoya, sorry, excuse me, is the director for Groundwork National Program on Climate Resilience and Land Use. And she has seen sustainability from both coasts. So originally from Queens, uh, but she earned her bachelor's in Portland, Oregon, sort of one of the sustainability pioneers. Uh, but she's taught at middle school. She went back to get a master's in urban planning at MIT, worked for the Massachusetts Division of Public Housing and Rental Assistance. So bringing all of these different areas of insight and expertise, she now leads Groundwork USA's Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership, which she will talk about. And John Evangelista um, is Director of Operations for Groundwork Elizabeth, that is in New Jersey, as many of you know. And John really is an expert with urban ag and landscape uh, of green infrastructure. And he heads, he's a co-director of the Climate Safe Neighborhood Project uh, as part of Groundwork USA. So just as a, an update is that John's not feeling 100%, so Kate is going to do a little bit of John's presentation, but John is available for questions. So he may be answering some questions uh, in the chat, or he may be answering some questions uh, during our Q&A. So with that, Kate, I will pass it on to you to give us a little insight about Groundwork USA and the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Initiative. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, and I'm just going to get my, as soon as Joe closes his presentation, I'll be able to get mine up. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. So my name is Kate. I am the Director of Climate Resilience, the National Director of Climate Resilience and Land Use at Groundwork USA. And I'll tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do in a moment. But I actually wanted to start with this picture right here. Uh, this is a photo of downtown Cincinnati, Ohio. And I want you folks to think to yourself that if you're hanging out on a real hot summer day in July, where do you want to be in this photo? If you're anything like me, you probably want to be on the left-hand side of this dotted line. There's a really lush tree canopy cover. There's some nice grass. There's actually even a pool on the lower left-hand side. But if you look over onto the right side of this dotted line, which by the way is still a predominantly residential area, there's a tremendous amount of impermeable pavement. The tree canopy cover is kind of scraggly. There's actually a few dead trees that we see. And that large industrial looking area near the bridge is going to be holding and radiating a lot of heat uh, and it is very likely to flood as well. And 
I think that this picture, I've, I've come to appreciate that picture of Cincinnati over the past couple of years, because I think that does a really great job of showing that the consequences of our changing climate are not being felt equally. We tend to think that that's true from country to country, from city to city within our country, from, uh, from, uh, but one of the things we don't think about is that from neighborhood to neighborhood and even from block to block, we're experiencing the climate crisis really differently. And part of the argument that I'm gonna make today is that that's not actually a coincidence. Uh, a little bit about Groundwork. Groundwork USA is the national support organization for 22 people-centered environmental justice organizations across the country. We're usually in the second or third largest city in any state. Um, and the work that we do focuses on putting residents in the driver's seat to make changes to their built environment so that they can live in the clean, green, and healthy spaces that they deserve and that they envision. So that's everything from acting as the city's urban forester and helping to densify the tree canopy cover um, to, and you can actually see John in the picture on the lower right-hand side, uh, to taking over contaminated parcels of land, also called brownfields, and transforming them into community assets like parks and trails and urban farms. Um, and more frequently, we've been moving into the climate resilience and climate adaptation work. How do we make sure that as the climate crisis continues to change our communities are safe, particularly from extreme heat and precipitation. Um, and so a couple of years ago, about four years now, we got to ask this really interesting question. Is there a relationship between historical race-based housing segregation? And in most cases, we're going to use redlining as a proxy for that. But you can also look at things like urban renewal histories or racial uh, land covenants, and then the modern day risk of the climate crisis, specifically from extreme heat and flooding. This is now a 13 city partnership. So everywhere from San Diego to New Orleans to Pawtucket and Central Falls, Rhode Island, we're working in a bunch of different contexts, cities that are large and small, cities with industrial histories, uh, cities with varying uh, degrees of government involvement in sustainability and resilience conversations to help not just answer that question of is there a relationship, but also figure out the so what. So what do we do about it? Um, I am aware that there's a lot of folks who are international uh, on this call. So I wanted to make sure that if you're not familiar with redlining, uh, I, I give you a really quick rundown. I promise I'll be brief to those of you who have either seen me present before or who um, are really familiar with this topic. So if we go back in time to the Great Depression, people are struggling. Um, back in the early uh, in the early 1900s and actually, yeah, in the early 1900s, we didn't have the 20 or 30 year mortgage the way that we do today. Instead, what happened is you would get a mortgage on your home and it would be a five-year mortgage and you would slowly over time pay down that principal, but at the end of five years, you would have to remortgage that balance. Well, it's the Great Depression. People don't have the money. Uh, people don't have the steady sources of income or employment to be able to get that remaining principal on their mortgage remortgaged. So by 1933, about 50, that's five zero percent of households or, or mortgages were in foreclosure. That's a huge eviction crisis that's on the horizon. And that's cutting off a lot of Americans from the primary mechanism for building intergenerational wealth, property ownership. So what the federal government did to make lending easier and to help loosen private lenders uh, standards so that they would lend to more people and give mortgages to more people was to create the federally backed mortgage, which said, hey, banks, if you lend to this person over here, I'm going to vouch for them. And if they default on their loan, the federal government will use taxpayer dollars to pick up the cap. Um, but the federal government had to figure out which places were quote unquote worthy of receiving the federally backed mortgages or were safe bets and which ones were risky bets. So for cities that were about 100,000 people or more, they sent out surveyors to create what they called risk assessment maps, what we colloquially called redlining maps today. Um, those neighborhoods that were considered to be great and totally worthy of the best rates and uh, to be backed by the federal government were outlined in green. Those usually had the right kind of white person because we know that definitions of whiteness change in American culture over time. Uh, one thing that I thought was kind of funny is uh, in a note for Rhode Island, they talk about the right kind of French person and the wrong kind of French person, the right kind being uh, French from France and then the wrong kind being Québécois. So making even that sort of cultural designation over which areas were considered desirable or not due to their population. Um, down on the other end of the spectrum, away from Green Line, were areas that were uh, outlined in red. Those areas traditionally had black and brown residents or high proportions of immigrants, lower quality housing stock, um, and a, a lower income to the population that was there. Um, so you might say like, okay, well, I guess that's fair. You know, you don't wanna put a uh, federally backed mortgage on a house that's maybe in crappy condition, I get that. Uh, well, this created a really interesting problem for municipalities. If you are a family that is living in a redlined area and you're interested in selling your house, 
you're going to have a hard time getting the value that you want because people are not going to be eligible for the federally backed mortgages that would allow them to stretch their debt over 20 or 30 years. Um, so you might have to accept a lower price than you otherwise would or, or work something out privately. If you're a Black family that's living in a red line area, you've got enough money to move into that beautiful house in the green lined area of town. You're not going to be able to do that because uh, residents and uh, lenders are not going to want to approve you for a mortgage or sell you that house because your very presence could potentially downgrade the uh, risk assessment of that neighborhood, making that neighborhood lose its eligibility for federally backed mortgages. So in a way, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't leave. It didn't create segregation. It just codified and maintained pre-1917 levels of segregation in community members. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is that stuff happened in the 1930s, um, but today we can see a really close relationship. Uh, neighborhoods that were formerly redlined have fewer parks sited in them. They have less dense tree canopy cover. In some cases, they don't even have sewer infrastructure that is upgraded to the same level that neighborhoods that were formerly greenlined were. Um, so we see that there is a, a lot of um, connection between the way that the built environment is today and the way that these neighborhoods were redlined. Every once in a while, someone says, Kate, are you sure that it's about race? Like, you know, housing stock's important. I wouldn't want to back a house that was next to a factory either. Um, it, one of the things that you can do is if you haven't been there yet, go to mapping inequality. Uh, and those folks have digitized all of the existing redlining maps that are in the National Archives. And you can actually read the clarifying remarks on why the surveyors chose to grade certain neighborhoods what they did. Uh, so this one is an interesting one from Richmond, Virginia. It's a C-graded neighborhood. It goes A is green, uh, B, C, and D. So this is a C-graded neighborhood. And it says, respectable people, but homes are too close to the Negro area, D2. This means that the very proximity to Blackness was enough to downgrade a neighborhood from again, having access to favorable rates and access to those federally backed mortgages. Um, there's also some work that was done to do to create a word cloud of some of the clarifying remarks across all of the 200 plus redlining maps that there are. Um, and if you look at the descriptions for the green and blue lines neighborhoods, those A and B uh, assessed neighborhoods, you see some pretty pleasant words, wooded and trees, shrubbery, shade, landscape, really the things that you would want to be around. But if you look at the descriptions of C and D lines neighborhoods, you see stuff that's a little bit more unsavory, things like paved and hot, um, odors, industry, things like that. Um, and again, I really want to emphasize that redlining did not cause segregation, it just codified it um, and made it a lot more difficult for uh, families to be able to move outside of the areas where they'd already been segregated, either through municipal law pre-1917 um, or through de facto segregation. One of the things I also think is important to note is uh, this, some people say like, well, that happened a really long time ago, the Civil Rights Act made uh, redlining unlawful. Um, if you're like me and are an elder millennial, that means that your parents' generation is the first generation since redlining was instituted to live the majority of their adult lives uh, without that barrier to home ownership. And again, we know that one of the best ways to build intergenerational wealth in our community, in our culture is through uh, land ownership and property ownership. Um, and then some folks also say, hey, Kate, that was happening a really, really long time ago. Well, if you look at the demographics of formerly redlined neighborhoods today, about 75% of those degraded neighborhoods are still low to moderate income neighborhoods today. And about two thirds of those formerly red line neighborhoods are still majority minority. Um, at this point, you might be saying like, hey, Kate, thanks for the history lesson. Um, but I, you know, still, what does that mean in terms of the modern built environment? Prove it to me, show it to me. Um, the next image that I'm gonna show you is a GIF of Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is located just south of New York City. Um, it is home to the second largest port in the country. And I think the first largest on the Eastern seaboard. Um, John, correct me in the comments if that's wrong. And what you're gonna see on top of it is a digitized red line now. And I just want a quick reminder, green, hey, you can get these federally backed mortgages, right kind of white people, good housing stock. On the other end, red, degraded, usually people of color, poor quality housing stock. And I want you to keep your eye on any green polygon that you see, any green lined area. It doesn't matter where it is, just find it. So this is Elizabeth, New Jersey. This is tree canopy cover as of 2016. This is impermeable pavement, so like parking lots and driveways and stuff um, as of 2016. And then this is relative heat with red being the hottest. Now I want you to find any red lined area. It doesn't matter where it is, just keep your eye on it. This is again, tree canopy cover, impervious pavement, and then relative heat 
with red being the hottest. You might start to notice something, but it's always a little dicey when you're looking at maps and data to just use the eye test to figure it out. So I can help you out with this bar chart. Um, that in the communities that we're working in for climate safe neighborhoods that were redlined, as you go from A to D, again, that's a green lined to red lined, that red bar, land surface temperature, goes up. That gray bar, which is in permeous pavement, so again, like parking lots, driveway, and we can use that as a proxy for flooding because the water doesn't have anywhere to go, also goes up pretty precipitously. This is my least favorite one. Uh, this is as you go from A to D, you see that tree canopy cover absolutely plummet with neighborhoods that are formerly degraded today being a lot hotter, a lot wetter, and having a lot less tree canopy cover in their communities. Um, some work that was done by Vivek Shandas in the top picture and Jeremy Hoffman in the lower picture found that in formerly redlined communities, today, those communities are on average 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than formerly greenlined communities, but that can be as extreme as 20 degrees Fahrenheit on the same day at the same time. And I want you to think about the difference between that temperature. 20 degrees is the difference between turning your air conditioner on and keeping it off. That's the difference between getting a $100 utility bill for cooling and a $250 one that you can't afford. That's the difference between playing with your kids outside in an afternoon in the summer and ending up in the hospital for heat strokes. There are real financial, social, and health risks that are associated to these temperature differentials. At this point, if you know anything about American history, you're probably kind of disappointed, but not terribly surprised. It's a little bit on brand, um, but you might be wondering what happens if my community wasn't redlined, because only about 200 cities were. Well, I promise you that there's a hot mess of a paper trail that's going to show some sort of race-based housing segregation. Um, I think Lawrence, Massachusetts, which is about 20 minutes north of where I'm sitting right now, is a really interesting example. Um, Lawrence is a planned city. Uh, it's right along the Merrimack River um, and was a major hub for textile manufacturing. People came from all over the world to work here, and it was actually a pretty heterogeneous community within the relatively small city of Lawrence. Um, and Lawrence itself was never actually redlined, but suburban communities are around Lawrence were. And over time, you saw wealthier, whiter residents who were eligible for these federally backed mortgages um, move to other areas such as Haverhill, Haverhill to get uh, to take advantage of, again, that property ownership and that land ownership. If you take a look at this map, which shows Lawrence in the center and the surrounding areas, there's a kind of an interesting dynamic here. You've got tree canopy cover, impervious pavement, relative heat with red being the hottest, and then poverty. Um, so it's something that looks a little bit similar, uh, even though Lawrence itself was not redlined. Another example is in Richmond, California. Back in the time when uh, we were involved in World War I, Richmond, California, which is in the California Bay Area, was a major hub for two things. One, uh, oil refinery, and uh, the second piece being um, the repair of warships. And a lot of folks moved from the, especially from the American South, a lot of black residents moved from the American South to get jobs working in these uh, repair areas to repair these ships and these repair yards. Um, and Richmond at the time was a really tiny hamlet. It was just re really, really small town. And all of a sudden the population boomed. The federal government knew that it needed to be able to house these wartime workers. So it signed a lot of contracts with uh, with local uh, contractors, local private contractors, and with the state to create public and private housing. Um, the public housing and private housing that was created for white residents tended to be of higher quality housing stock. And it was actually mandated in the contracts from the federal government that the contractors had to use lower quality materials to build the homes of black residents. The idea was we don't wanna invest in something where we're gonna really just wanna kick all the black residents out at the end of the war and raise these areas and get white families in there in higher quality housing stock. Um, so the areas where residents, uh, black residents mostly settled was in this area called the Black Crescent, uh, with the Iron Triangle being a, a historically African American neighborhood today. Um, and in that area, mostly black residents uh, settled and you can see in this map today which uh, shows asthma rates within the Black Crescent, so the darker the area, meaning the higher the asthma rates, that there's still a relationship um, between the way that people experience the built environment and the history of how and why they got to live there. The Iron Triangle is uh, has a, the refinery on one side and then two petrochemical rail yards crisscrossing it. So that's kind of what creates the triangle shape. So you can imagine that asthma rates are uh, much higher. In Richmond, California, that Iron Triangle and Black Crescent area, where again, the majority of Black residents in Richmond, California live today, has higher rates of asthma, 
higher rates of COVID, maternal mortality, infant mortality, pretty much anything that you would be disappointed to hear about, except for cancer. And that's because the life expectancy of Black residents in that area is so much lower than uh, either mixed race communities or white communities that people don't get to age into cancer because cancer tends to be a disease that you age into. Um, at this point, you probably feel like this. You're like, hey, I came for some hope about the future and this lady's totally bumming me out. What am I going to do about it? Well, I promise uh, that I'm going to get to the things of, of how you can help. One of the things I want to make sure that no one leaves this presentation from uh, is the idea that, oh, Kate, I got it. The solution is to plant things. We're going to densify the tree canopy cover. We're going to rip up the pavement. And then we are done. Um, well, the answer to that is like sort of you should do that thing. Please advocate for that change in your communities and in surrounding communities. It's really important that we get that greenery in. Um, but there are some limits to that. This is a picture of a tree that was planted about three years ago in front of my apartment in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, um, before these trees got planted, there were actually no trees in the public right of way. Uh, and this tree is going to be the bomb in 10, 15 years. It's going to be great. But right now it's casting a shadow that's about the size and shape of a pizza box. There are also other elements to the built environment that keep it from growing. You might notice those really low hanging power lines. That means that all of the trees planted on our block are actually dwarf varietals. So they will never get high enough to cast shade over the buildings that are always going to have disproportionately high cooling costs compared to other uh, homes in the same city. So excited about these trees. Please get them uh, planted. But what we really should be asking is why is this change not yet come about? And that's what Climate Safe Neighborhoods is. We're interested not just in making sure that the green infrastructure happens, but that we change the way that systems function so that that harm doesn't happen again. You can learn more about our, our partnership on our website, groundworkusa.org. Our Climate Safe Neighborhoods partnership is divided into three sections. The first one is using maps, many of the ones that I've showed, shown you and a number that I'm going to show you throughout the presentation to help understand, help residents and stakeholders understand why do our neighborhoods look the way that they do? Our neighborhoods don't look like this by accident. That means that they're not gonna change by accident. And we need to have a really good understanding of how things work in order to make that change. Um, in the second year, we work very closely with residents to help understand their priorities. What do you wanna see different about the built environment? What are the areas that are causing you trouble or concern? Is your basement flooding? Is your kids walk to work too hot? Um, and then we also help to build their power and, and help to empower them by helping them to understand the way that systems work. For example, why do you have a city council and a mayor? How are decisions about the city's funding being made? How come your city doesn't have an arborist and what can we do about that to get trees into the public right of way? And in the final year, residents self-advocate for a more equitable distribution of resources through an organizing campaign that they lead. Uh, they're interested in getting resources that are proportionate to the risk that they are facing and have had some really awesome success stories. So to sum that up, we're interested in two things. Yes, we wanna see that system changed. Our neighborhoods look, look like this for a reason. We have to change the elements that have maintained the differences in how people experience the climate crisis. But we also need solutions for now because it's hot and wet and dangerous right this very minute. Last summer, um, where I am in Massachusetts, we had 11 days above 90 degrees before July 1st. That's a huge risk for, um, and for a community that's better known for its blizzards than its blistering heat. One of the things that's so powerful about the maps that we utilize is that it asks and forces people to ask some pretty uncomfortable questions related to unfairness in their city. So for example, this picture on the left-hand side, why is it that the northern part of Richmond, Virginia, which the majority of uh, the city's black people live in, has a higher heat and a higher land surface temperature than some of the areas that are either mixed race or where predominantly white residents live. Why is it in Elizabeth, New Jersey, where the uh, highest percentage of Hispanic people live in the northern part of the city is also the area that has the least amount of tree canopy cover. These are really uncomfortable questions, but they're really important ones. One of the things that's been so surprising to me about this work is uh, these maps serve as a neutral platform for conversations about equity. It's not you versus me. It's not your ancestors versus my ancestors. It's there's something happening in our city and we need to solve it together. I want to tell you two quick case studies. This first one is uh, in Rhode Island, where we had climate safe neighborhoods. Um, it was our first cohort of climate safe neighborhoods. And uh, in this city, tree planting that was done in the public right of way was done on a first come first serve model and an English home 
only model. This uh, particular uh, area has a really high proportion of people from Dominican Republic and uh, Cape Verde, which means that materials probably should have been translated into Spanish and Portuguese. And when the tree planting opened for first come first serve, folks who were already in wealthier, more resourced areas who knew about it and had a deeper connection to the city were the first ones to snatch up these trees. Um, the city also wasn't planting a ton of trees, about 50 per year. Uh, and the areas that did not have enough trees are pretty hot and pretty unwalkable. Um, and you can see here the tree canopy cover, and that's uh, spread over the, um, the, the digitization of the redlining map. You can see that pretty much just the entire city is, is pretty hot and uncomfortable, except for um, some of the green lined areas. So the folks in Groundwork Rhode Island led some community science where they pulled residents around together to understand their priorities around flood and around heat. Um, and a number of people noted gosh, my walk to work or my kids walk to school is just too darn hot and we need to pay attention to the areas where folks need shade along their commute. Um, so part of the uh, community science that residents did was to actually go out to those beg buttons. Uh, you know, those buttons that you press when you want to cross, this, cross the street and you know, there's a little bit of magic involved. Is it actually connected? You don't really know. Uh, well, a number of them are actually just broken and would not you know, do the yellow lights are flashing, they would not um, change the light in any capacity. So residents went around and took note of where those um, broken bed buttons were at major intersections and the land surface temperature and found that people could be, you know, on a particular day in July could be rating 101 degree heat waiting for a moment to dash across the street. So they wanted to identify what some of the areas of vulnerability were. Um, one of the things I think is so neat about the work that Groundwork Rhode Island did is that they partnered with uh, a unique government sponsored infrastructure called the Health Equity Zone, which brings together people from multiple sectors to focus on issues of health. And people don't always think about the climate crisis as being a health crisis, but it is if you're talking about people's ability to stay safe from their pre existing conditions like diabetes and heart disease and asthma, heat is gonna be really relevant to that. Whether or not their basements are flooding is gonna be really uh, relevant to that. So the health equity zone allowed Grammar Rhode Island to pull together a really broad coalition of stakeholders. They were successful in getting the materials uh, for the city translated into multiple languages um, and to changing the first come first serve model. So the city no longer does a first come first serve, but instead uses a tree equity score to understand how resources are distributed throughout the city and who's the most vulnerable and to prioritize those communities instead. Dead. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of areas of vulnerability in the city, but some areas are more vulnerable than others. Um, so this is a really big win, but there's a problem. Small cities tend to be pretty resource constrained. They're not planting 50 trees because they think that is the maximum they should do. They just don't have the money for it. Uh, but one of the things that's so nice is using this data, using resident uh, partnerships using their broad coalition of stakeholders, Groundwork Rhode Island was able to secure $100,000 for tree planting uh, for the city using this health equity zone slash tree equity score model. So we've changed the system and we've also changed access to resources and, the, and how those resources are distributed and diversified where those resources come from. The last example that I'm going to give you is from uh, Denver, Colorado, and Denver passed a uh, ballot measure called Ballot 2A, which creates a steady annual stream of funding, about $40 million a year, for the development of green infrastructure and the rehab of green spaces. But there was really poor transparency about how this money was going to be distributed. Um, prior ballots that had created money for similar programs, no one really knew how one neighborhood got prioritized and there was not a ton of community voice. Um, and so we created these, these maps and we're sitting around with residents. There's actually a woman from the Globeville neighborhood, um, which is a, the entire neighborhood is a super fun site. It's, it's home to a former lead smelting plant, predominantly um, Latina, immigrant, Latina immigrants in that neighborhood. Um, and it was actually one of the residents who found that their neighborhood had 1% tree canopy cover. But if you got on a bus, and took the number 12 bus across the river, you would end up in a formerly green-lined neighborhood that had 24% tree canopy cover. This uh, mapping system allowed us to come up with a very specific and concrete ask. We want 10,000 trees in 10 years and a say in funding distribution. You can go around all the live long day and get resident experience as you should um, and hear that people are saying that it's hot outside, but man, when you're able to connect the lived experience of residents to some real data and anchor it in the type of data that you would like to see change, that's where really powerful asks come from. We also established an intervention academy where we pull together 
10 promotoras, which are community health workers, um, and helped to train them on how to do community organizing, advocacy, and government intervention. Uh, and we celebrated their graduation. And one of the things that I think is so neat is uh, through a broad coalition of stakeholders, the, the city actually opened up a funding distribution board um, that allows uh, more transparency over where that $40 million a year is going. Uh, four residents from this committee are actually on that board, and one is the co-chair. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to say uh, is sort of, you know, so what can we do about it? You might be saying, cool story, Kate, but what can people in grass top positions do? What can people who are not able to or willing to or interested in being on that grassroots roots level do to cause that systems change and actually get those solutions in the ground? Well, the first thing I want you to recognize is that there's no single 100% solution. There's no panacea. There's no magic wand that you're going to bippity boppity boo to fix things. Um, instead, what we're looking for is pulling together a bunch of 1% solutions that are hopefully going to tip the scale towards equity and to focus neighborhood by neighborhood on that. Now that we've got that out of the way, I think the three major things I can leave you with are one, rethink the experts. We tend to think of people uh, who are, have expertise as being, um, you know, the hydrologists and the urban planners and the architects. Those people are an important part of the process and we don't want to lose their participation. But folks who are on the ground experiencing the climate crisis day in and day out have a really, really good sense of what types of interventions um, need to be put in place in their communities. So rethink who is an expert and look out into the community for local expertise and compensate them. Those people should be paid the same way that a planner or a hydrologist should be paid for their expertise in labor. Uh, the second piece is if you're one of those folks who's lucky enough to control data, make it useful and usable. The United States is really unique in that we have a, just really a, a unique amount of data that's available to us. Um, you can get census data, you can get land cover data, satellite data, um, but a lot of people don't know how to use it. So if you have access to data, make the punchlines and the information useful to the layperson so that they can use it to self-advocate for a more equitable distribution of resources. Um, and then the final piece is to um, either yourself or get someone else to tap into existing data resources. There's a tremendous number of folks that are working on doing things like cataloging land surface temperature or what uh, landslide risk is in different communities. Um, so make sure that you're aware of and spreading the words about existing resources. Um, the final thing that I'll say is that it's up to all of us to mess up the system. The system is working as designed in a lot of ways and it's fully functional. Um, and we really need to overturn it by rethinking who the experts are, centering community voice um, and looking to not just stop the or not just get solutions in the ground but also stop and identify where long-term systems of harm are coming from um so the last way that i'll say that you can do that is to also make sure that you're naming who is not in the room when decisions are made that's part of um, identifying and and preserving local expertise um, and look to support people-centered organizations who engage in a shared leadership and decision-making model um, organizations and institutions should not be parachuting into communities, dropping some solutions and piecing out. It's through that long-term connection with residents that you get stewardship and sustainability. So if you wanna learn more about our organization, hit up groundworkusa.org. Feel free to email me. As you can tell, I love talking about this stuff and could do it all over a long day. Um, and I think we're gonna pause there for questions before I do the next part of the presentation. So thanks for listening, everybody. Hey, that was fantastic. Um, Thank you. And so I, your, uh, your energy is infectious. Uh, Thanks. And, and in some ways, that's, uh, that's important, right, in this work, because uh, the work is, as they say, is never done. It's always continuing. Mm. So sure. I guess I have one question for you, and I see there's a couple other that are coming through the Q&A, is tell us why it's important to have this kind of blend of the, we'll say, on the ground one percent solutions with the systems mm -hmm. change? I mean, what's really the, the benefit of trying to do both? Because it sounds sometimes like, oh, like I can only do one or the other, but. Yeah, yeah. And it's always important to keep um, the idea that, that you can pet two cats with one hand uh, in doing that. You can make sure that you're, you're thinking about whatever the systems are that have caused that harm. And one of the reasons why at Groundwork we really like to address both at the same time is that there's a lot of distrust and mistrust in the community. Maybe they've seen a bunch of trees planted, but they weren't maintained and there wasn't money to keep them alive. And all of a sudden they have no more tree canopy cover anymore. So there's a really long history of uh, people trying to do the right thing, but not having the long-term perspective of what it takes to sustain that change. The harm came from a reason. It's not 
not accidental. It did not come out of thin air. And so if we're going to have any hope of making this the 1% solution sustainable to have them last for long enough to keep people safe from the climate crisis, we need to address that root harm. Um, one of the things that we're working on in my neighborhood, and this is actually happening right outside my window, um, is that there is a half mile long gas leak along Somerville Avenue that's killed all of the trees in our neighborhood. And so a bunch of residents, this is like off the groundwork clock, um, a bunch of residents and I uh, put together a large coalition of people to try and get Eversource to fix that leak. But one of the long-term systems change challenges that we were thinking of is if they replace that pipe, that means our community is stuck on gas for a lot longer. Is there a way for us to get them to repair just the leaks so that we have more time to be able to advocate for a change to an electrified system? So that's an example of keeping the 1% solution, fixing the leak so we can uh, get the trees replanted because all the trees are dead on that half mile stretch. And then also the systems change solution. Um, how do we move towards an ultimate goal of getting off of natural gas in our community and making the way for electrification? We don't want to trip over our own feet uh, in favor of a short term goal and completely lose sight of the long term goal. Great, right, right. So it's sort of making some of those important connections. And I sort of see then groundwork, whether it's Groundwork USA at headquarters where you're managing the whole initiative or mm -hmm. The groundwork uh, trust in you know Lawrence or mm -hmm. in Lowell is doing that same kind of connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions about well, what about some of the potential side effects of urban greening? So you know, mm. it's well designed, it starts to become more attractive, and that could yeah. be displacement and gentrification. How are you guys sort of balancing that and trying to mitigate those? potential harms. Yeah, the green gentrification is one that weighs on us a lot because we tend to transform places pretty intensely. I think one of the best examples of that is uh, the Sawmill River in Yonkers, New York, which is right in the Hudson Valley, which is just north of New York City. Um, and the daylighting, and daylighting really just means like there's a river underground, someone paved it, and you rip the pavement up and make it nice. Um, doing that, ripping up that parking lot and creating this gorgeous uh, area, the neighborhood went from one that wasn't super desirable to having luxury condos that you can see in the background with their beautiful glass facades, you know, peeking over into this thing that's supposed to be a community resource for the people who've suffered with that, um, you know, paved over area for a really long time. And is it climate equity if the people who've done the work to make the community nicer, to make it safer, end up having to leave? I would argue that it's not, and that's not a very equitable outcome. Um, one of the ways that we circumvent that or that we try to circumvent that is we uh, don't work just with environmental justice people. We tend to have really broad coalitions of stakeholders intentionally. So we bring in the people who are working in affordable housing. We work closely with the public housing authorities and make sure that those people have a seat at the table because we are not housers. We're never gonna be housers. We're not housing experts but our work does have an impact on the battle that those folks are, are, um, are, are waging. So one of the really important stakeholders in Denver, for example, is having the Global Alaria Swansea Coalition, and they focus on both housing affordability and the creation of community land trusts. Um, that said, I think that I, I personally believe that the um, green gentrification is a little bit of a red herring. Uh, I, I think that the um, change that happens to property values is one that we take for granted as having to happen when it really doesn't. It's people who've you know, been able to charge lower rents or lower property values for, for a really long time, all of a sudden change their mind because of the market and desirability. There's no free hand of the market. People are making actual decisions to raise their rents or to raise um, the prices of land. And I think that we need to view and question that axiom of our culture that everybody has a right to infinite returns on their property just through owning it. So I think that we need to think about immediate solutions, having housing providers at the table, making sure that they're helping to guide some of our decisions, but we need to think about the broader system. Um, why is it that we believe we can have infinite returns on property, and should we be looking for different ways to change the, the way that the system functions so we can make changes to uh, lower income or high risk and vulnerable neighborhoods um, without displacing those people? So it's really, really, it's a big issue. It's, it's really complicated, uh, and as you can tell, I have a lot of feelings about it, but I think it's the same 1% solution. Systems change have to work hand in hand. Right. Well, and again, I think in some communities, there's a perception or maybe fear of green gentrification when that may not really be the case, depending on mm -hmm. data. So certainly yeah. understanding the baseline data of, you know, the values of those properties. But you also talk about, hey, we have a climate crisis that is getting more severe every day. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can't just stand on the sidelines, right? We need to like, do those yeah, and, 
And, and the harm and risk is something that's so multifaceted. Uh, if you have a chance, anyone who's on the webinar to check out Groundwork Jacksonville, this is in Jacksonville, Florida, um, they're developing this really interesting uh, Emerald Greenway, which cuts through most of downtown Jacksonville, um, rehabilitates a number of contaminated parcels and creates this uh, space that is for recreation, um, but also to help revitalize downtown, downtown corridors. And they're seeing property values skyrocket wherever the Emerald Trail is planned. Um, something that I really appreciate is that Groundwork Jacksonville has taken a resident-centered approach to uh, addressing gentrification and displacement related to, to their work and is interested in how can we utilize this opportunity to close some of the wealth gap between higher income and lower income people. So to make sure that folks, um, start, you know, if they are going to sell their property, are they taking advantage of, uh, of um, are they taking advantage of this as a way to help uh, reduce debt and increase the wealth of their family members for people who have traditionally been excluded from these systems? So there's a whole spectrum of ways to deal with it, um, you know, from, hey, let's decommodify land and try to get a community land trust all the way to let's um, let's let's train people on how to get the best, like, you know, bang for their buck in selling their property so that they can take advantage of this situation. Well, before we pivot and do a little deeper dive in, uh, in Elizabeth, is here's more of a tactical question, which is mm -hmm. what are some of the methods that Groundwork uses to reach out to community members that don't have access to technology? Uh, so yeah, what, yeah, what are some of those sort of on the ground uh, strategies that you all use? Yeah, um, even before the pandemic, one of the things that we were really focused on was uh, meeting people where they are. Uh, and when I say that, I mean that both figuratively and literally. So we're big on showing up at places where people are going to be, you know, the supermarket on a Sunday afternoon, um, the farmer's market at, at a PTA event, uh, you know, tabling outside. Um, we're always interested in making sure that residents don't have the burden of having to come to us where we are, but that we're going to go, we're going to listen deeply, and we're going to prioritize some of their concerns. Um, so that's everything from tabling to holding events. One of my favorites is actually in Rhode Island, um, uh, uh, Leandro Castro, who was the coordinator at uh, Grammar of Rhode Island, did this, uh, and he actually lived in the community that he was doing this climate safe neighborhoods work on, and he got a whole bunch of rain barrels that were donated. A big problem in that community was people's basements flooding because there was so much impervious pavement. Um, and basement flooding might sound like a little blip, uh, but for a lot of these residents, they had um, living quarters on the, the lower levels of their home. So, you know, your drywall gets moldy. That's a huge expense for you to deal with. Your carpet, your clothes, your furniture, that's a huge expense if you're already a low income family. So um, doing downspout planters and, and uh, rain barrels was one of the solutions that, that he, one of the 1% solutions. Um, and he used that as an opportunity to, to hear about people's concerns and, you know, what else is bothering you and, and, and use those interactions where he was teaching people how to invest in their homes and keep their families safe. And at the same time, having meaningful conversations to learn more about what people needed and let them know about the resources that we had available and the, um, the, the plans that we had to help change the way that trees were distributed in this particular city. So we find whatever opportunities that they are to deeply and meaningfully connect with folks. We don't want it to be extractionary. We, we don't want to be there if they don't want us there. Um, and we want to make sure that their concerns are front and center. Great. Well, let's do a pivot and talk a little bit about Elizabeth. And again, Great. John, we know you're not 100%, but Kate's going to sort of tee up this focus on Elizabeth yeah. and Certainly, you know, to the extent you can, John, you know, yeah. feel free to, to chime in. Cool. Thanks so much. Oh. Um, John, I'm going to do it justice. Feel free to like jump in if anything goes wrong, but I'm going to do, do the best I can to, uh, to represent the wonderful work that's happening in Elizabeth. Um, so Grammar Elizabeth was part of the first cohort of climate safe neighborhoods. So they were on us when we weren't sure if this was gonna work, if we didn't know if we could do systems change and those 1% solutions at the same time. So they are the OG climate strategy people. Um, and one of the things you need to know about Elizabeth is that it's a, a good part of the city is an environmental justice community. The urban heat island effect is incredibly severe. You can see the land surface temperature map at the top of this slide um, and flooding is really severe. They, um, over the past couple of years have dealt with some incredibly tragic and uh, deadly and heartbreaking um, uh, floods from Hurricane Sandy. And most recently this past summer from Hurricane Ida where around 30 residents actually drowned in the first floor um, of their apartments. So when we talk about flooding being severe, it's a crisis that the city is very aware of and is working very hard in partnership with um, nonprofits like Groundwork Elizabeth to try and rectify and keep people safe. So residents are at risk, but there's a tremendous amount of potential to revitalize the community. It's um, 
a strong uh, bunch of strong uh, tight knit neighborhoods with really wonderful people who are interested in and dedicated to making change in their environment. And so what Groundwork Elizabeth is interested in is how can we not just reduce the risk from the climate crisis, but also create these safe and highly programmed culturally rich spaces so that residents don't just want to accept that there is a change to their built environment, but act as really long term stewards and care for that, um, those changes to the environment. Uh, but we've got a really big question, how? Um, Groundwork Elizabeth has a very close relationship with the city and is thankful for that partnership, but definitely didn't want to come in guns a blazing saying you need to change this and here's, you know, history of how that worked um, and really wanted to create a, a deeper connection, let folks know the truth about the risk that residents in Elizabeth are facing, but also create a path forward in partnership with one another. So Groundwork Elizabeth was able to create this great strategy of educate, empower, and implement, thinking about how they can uh, tell the history of Elizabeth, but also make sure that green infrastructure um, comes to fruition. So where they started was with city leadership. They spoke with the mayor and with the city councilors um, and used the data that we created. So things like the maps. Uh, we also have a great partnership with NASA Develop where they use Landsat data to give us a better sense of flood risk and flood modeling risk in different areas of the cities that we work in. Um, and use that data to create a connection between um, the risk that we were seeing on the ground and the way that human beings were going to experience that risk throughout Elizabeth. And that was something that was tremendously successful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these maps serve as, a, uh, as an equitable and neutral platform for conversations about equity. It's not about you or me. It's about our shared space where we live, our home, the place that we love is in danger. What are we going to do about it? Um, and John said, I'm going to copy John as he has on this slide. I, he often says that, that you can't unsee the story once you unsee it. So like that gift that I showed you, that's probably going to stick with you for a minute. The fact that um, we see really stark differences in how people are experiencing the climate risk. So both the mayor and the city councilor were really open to this and were really interested in seeing how can we make on the ground change and utilize this data to come up with a strategy. And, and, and the mayor actually um, made some changes to the master planning language, uh, acknowledging some of the data that um, Gramark Elizabeth had brought to light about the connection between historical race-based housing segregation and the modern climate crisis. So Gramark Elizabeth went out and met community members where they were at the community center, at food pantries, uh, have close relationships with the uh, Elizabeth Housing Authority, with the, li with the library where they actually have a, some green infrastructure installed uh, there as well, and wanted to understand what are residents' priorities? How are you experiencing heat? How are you experiencing flood and flood risk? Flood risk is definitely one of the things that uh, Elizabeth residents brought up as a major priority. So using this data, the folks in Elizabeth were able to take the priorities and the prioritized areas that residents were concerned with and overlap it with vulnerability to identify where they could start to do some demonstration projects to show that change is possible and to show that it's something that we can do and do on a relatively short timeline. So a couple examples of this uh, this implement side. So we've got the educate, we've got the implement side here um, are to do things like installing rain gardens and downspout uh, downspout planters, um, and just getting infrastructure in that's going to help manage the flood water that would cover Elizabeth streets, cover sidewalks, end up in people's basements, and prioritize residents' participation in this. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to involve residents in the actual development of this, planting the flowers, uh, you know, scattering the gravel, making decisions, because if residents feel like they've been a part of it, they can say, hey, that's not just a rain garden that someone built, that's my rain garden. My family helped to put that in and we're going to keep an eye on it. We're going to be long-term stewards of this particular resource in our community. Um, then COVID happened, like right in the middle of it. And everything just sort of went off the rails. Everybody was really scared. Nobody knew what was happening. Um, and it was difficult for uh, to connect to residents in the same places. Um, John actually doesn't have this on his slides, but I'm going to take a detour for a second because I think that this was a really brilliant um, resource, um, is that a lot of people were stuck at home uh, and didn't really know what to do. There were food security concerns. There were recreation concerns, especially for older populations. Um, and they actually established something called an Everyone Gets a Garden program. I think there was a more official name for it, but uh, they went around with materials for people to have their own container gardens to grow food, which is helpful for you know getting people outside while still safe and social distance, um, giving folks an activity to do, particularly older and younger folks. Uh, and it was also a way to check in with people. How are you? 
do you have access to the resources that you need? Or are you and the people in your family safe? Um, you know, it's gonna be really hot. Do you have enough to cover your utility bills and helping to cover people, uh, connect people to these uh, social services? So this is just one of the many ways in which uh, even though COVID-19 presented a huge curveball, Groundwork Elizabeth was able to, to dig deep into that community partnership. Because ultimately it's about the humans and the lived experience of those humans. And we wanna make sure people are taken care of. So the, Mayor's Youth Council is really where empowerment comes in. The Mayor's Youth Council is a program through Climate, um, through Climate Elizabeth that pulls together youth and helps to educate them about things like air quality, flooding, environmental justice issues, and gets their ideas and their thoughts about how the built environment needs to change. These are all local youth from the neighborhoods that uh, Groundwork Elizabeth works in. And the mayor, who is very interested in and very dedicated to making change in response to this data, in response to those maps that he was unable, you know, able, unable to unsee, pulled the youth together and now currently pulls the youth together in meetings every month to discuss the type of change that residents would like to see on the ground and that these youth council members would like to see on the ground. Well, one of the priorities that the youth got and that residents in Elizabeth have is to turn Elizabeth into a city with a much more robust tree canopy cover. The mayor is tremendously supportive of this community vision uh, and is really supportive in seeing the future of Elizabeth grow and develop and their ability to organize and to advocate and to create a green space for themselves um, and has supported uh, financially the uh, the, the planting of hundreds of trees, I think over the last couple of years, grammar, last year or two, Groundwork Elizabeth was able to plant about 400 and something trees, but there are 750 trees now that are authorized for planting in vulnerabilities this year and probably many more that Groundwork Elizabeth is going to plant. So by investing in this youth council, by investing in the youth of Elizabeth, who can serve as an intermediary between residents and between the local government, they were able to change the way decisions were made. They weren't just planting trees, they weren't just getting rain gardens in, they were changing the way that decisions were made and resources were distributed so that there was a more people-centered and data-centered focus, which I think is really uh, is, is really fantastic. Um, and I'm not as, uh, John, you feel free to jump in or we can go to the next slide. I'm not as uh, sort of well-suited to, to talk about this slide, but I will say that one of the things that Groundwork Elizabeth is tremendous at is having multi-sector partnerships. So they work really closely with uh, other institutions like Rutgers University um, and like the EPA to help create different ways to gather data to help affect that change. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that piece, John. Sure. We um yeah we've we've done a lot of 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 work that that we're starting to see a um um see the, the change actually happen. Um and it all started with a small grant from sustainable New Jersey <clears throat> to incorporate um some green infrastructure projects that help us educate the community. Uh, we worked in partnership with Rutgers University to create a green infrastructure guide, uh, <laughs> um, which which is great. And we use that at all of our tabling events. It basically goes through and touches on how green infrastructure could be used on a um, uh, on more of a, uh, a grassroots effort inside your community mm -hmm. with rain barrels and rain catchments and cool. and, and things like that. And um, our our EPA. Um, environmental justice grant has um, expanded our air monitoring section, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, so, so that's the things that we're doing um, on the ground that are actually changing what's going on. Well, thanks so much, John, for jumping in on that. So Elizabeth has no shortage of ideas about 1% solutions. Again, they always keep the systems change element in mind. Why is it that a harm exists? What sort of data do we need to understand what that harm is and how it's impacting people? And then what, where do we go from there to help make changes to it? So one of the really exciting uh, partnerships that, they're just start, that they've um, started recently is in their um, an expanded air quality monitoring campaign. Um, they are going to be working with with three other with sorry with two other cities in Elizabeth, New Jersey, to monitor air quality. As you can imagine, Elizabeth being the second largest port in the country, and then being so close to New York Airport, um, is makes air quality a really huge concern. There's also a number of diesel trucks uh, that are that transport goods from that port and from the airport through the city to different parts of the country. So air quality is a really big concern for residents of, of Elizabeth. And I'm so excited to say that they were awarded a pretty sizable multi-year um, EPA grant and monitor air in the port um, and along the road to help them collect da data and make some sort of a case for environmental justice changes. So things like getting more electric cars on the road um, or potentially changing the routes of where some of those trucks uh, go to reduce the impact on the surrounding areas. 
Um, this one is really exciting. Uh, I encourage you to, if you haven't heard of these before, just to like hop online and do a quick Google search of them. But these are the microforests. Um, and Groundwork Elizabeth uh, has planted one and is soon to plant some more. Uh, and they've partnered with a foundation to build the first microforest in New Jersey. And microforests, the, the big idea of them is that you take some sort of an underutilized and relatively small parcel and do an incredibly dense planting of three-ish categories of plants, uh, native trees, native shrubs, and native ground cover. Um, the idea being that by having these plants in such close proximity to one another, there's going to be a tremendous amount of competition. Um, and that it, uh, in, that some studies have shown that it grows about 10 times faster than if you were to spread some of these plants out over a larger area. You pay very close attention to it over about three years, maintaining it, you know, removing any sort of dead or dying plants, and it'll get established and be able to, to take care of itself and create sort of an urban oasis uh, on things like uh, brownfield parcels, which are contaminated lands that wouldn't be used otherwise. Um, and that they also, because of the root system of the trees and shrubs, helps to capture storm water, which is a huge issue uh, in Elizabeth. There's also the cooling capacity as well. I don't remember the actual uh, uh, statistics from this, but even relatively small forests or parks that have dense tree canopy cover can have a cooling effect about a half mile away from wherever that, I don't remember the size of the parcel needs to be, but from, from those parcels. Um, and adds to bi biodiversity. So as you can see, Groundwork Elizabeth has done a really great job prioritizing both those 1% solutions and thinking about long-term systems change. So John, I hope I did that, that justice on short notice, but I'm such a fan of the work that Groundwork Elizabeth does and hope that you guys will head to their website um, at groundworkelizabeth.org and learn more about them there as well. Thanks so much, Kate. That was perfect. Yeah. It really was. I couldn't yeah. have done it better myself. <laughs> so John, there it. was a quick question there about what were some of the subjects included in your green infrastructure guide? Uh, the green infrastructure guide touched on um, stormwater management, um, sometimes on a smaller scale as well as a larger scale. Uh, just for example, we have a urban farm behind a library in Elizabeth that sits on about a little more than three quarters of an acre, but it's extremely small. Um, when the library parking lot was built, um, from the day it was built, there was a flooding issue. It flooded back there. It flooded the building next to it. Over the past 10 years, uh, we went from maybe two storms a year with over an inch of rain to, I think, last year we had 17. Um, it 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 flooded it flooded the building next door we worked in partnership with the city they came in and built a little sore basin from it and we ran off of that sore basin into a rain garden to purify the water um, and we have a test port on the other side where a few times a year we actually test the water coming out to make sure it's okay and then we were able to run it into an easement which goes into a city sore eventually but the slowing down of the water coming out of the parking lot going through the rain garden corrected this problem and it didn't dump it right back into the source. Elizabeth is a CSO city, it's a combined sewer overflow. So as we get these heavy rains, our sewer system com combines and needs to flush out um, in a nutshell, that's basically what happens. Um, so the less water we dump into our sewer systems during these rainfalls, the better. And this was just a fantastic way to do it. That was just one thing. Um, it goes to green roofs. It touches on um, uh, rainwater catchment, bioswales, um, downspout planters, um, pedestrian walkway planters that work as water catchment systems, which will ease them back into the system. And I can supply that to you um, to send out to everybody. Oh, that's great. I mean, again, those sort of low impact development kind of tools and techniques, right? It sounds like, hey, a rain barrel, you know, that's part of green infrastructure. Um, and so, again, focusing on this theme of 1% solutions, I guess when you start adding them up, it's it's a lot more than just those 1%. So here's that a question great. for for both of you in terms of, you know, the P word, which is politics. So the example in Elizabeth with, you know, the mayors and the, you know, the youth and the leadership academy, that's great. But, you know, what if you're in a small town where they, some of the elected officials, or it could be city, county manager, climate change is something that either they don't believe in 
or maybe it's they're not paying attention to it or, you know, so, I mean, how have you all sort of navigated some of those questions, you know, with political leadership that just, yeah, has is, is been reluctant to sort of tackle the, the climate crisis, let alone then the overlay of, you know, redlining race and equity. One of the things that, one of the reasons why I think this sort of question is so important is that it opens up the conversation to where this is and is not possible. And I think it's possible everywhere. We definitely do work in some cities where the local government does not believe in a couple of things. They don't believe in the climate crisis and they also don't believe that systemic racism exists. Not a thing that happened, it ended. Martin Luther King, Civil Rights Act, we're done. Um, and we actually see that not just in places, not just in uh, cities that are you would consider to be more likely to think that, you know, smaller cities, smaller towns. We actually also see this in some of our big northeastern cities. So, so the idea that this is, you know, that you're safe if you're in some sort of, a, you know, big New England city or a, a big West Coast city is not always true. Um, and what we have done is one leaned really heavily on the maps and on the data because it depersonalizes it um, and helps people to have conversations that are depoliticized in a way. When I say that it's neutral, it really has surprised me. Um, there are people in my own family who are sort of big, not to draw politics too much into it, but are, who are, don't believe in systemic racism, don't believe in the climate crisis or big MAGA supporters, and even them seeing, you know, where they lived. Oh, gosh, you know, I'm still not sure that I believe in the climate crisis, but I do note that it's 25 degrees hotter in this particular area, and that is a problem. So to really focus on, you know, even if you don't really care about the origins of it, that's fine, we're gonna get to you in the system solution piece a little bit later, but let's start with that 1% solution. Let's start with acknowledging that there's some sort of a problem or a difference, and let's start trying to dig into it. Yeah, you did notice that it's 20 degrees hotter in this part of town, why do you think that is? Why do you think that we haven't had trees planted there? gosh, you know, how is the city budgeting things? How are resources getting distributed? Why do we think this neighborhood has more or less political power? And folks are really open to that type of conversation, even if they don't you know, sort of believe or acknowledge certain axioms or foundations to their work, they can see that, that there's a change. So I think that you know, having conversations that are data focused and data driven, um, not being accusatory, again, it's not you versus me, my party versus your party, it's this part of the city is really hot and, and people are getting sick and, and, and what are we going to do about it? Um, so, so that's a, I'd say that that's one of the biggest things that we lean on. John, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I was just going to say, yeah, um, just in Elizabeth, for example, we have a mayor for 27 years. Wow. Um, when I walk up to Mayor Bolwich and I say, hey, we want to convert all the bus stations into cooling stations, um, he's you know, gonna first question is gonna be, and where's this money coming from? How do you expect yeah. us to do this? Um, so again, we 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 formed a little bit of a different approach. We 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 speak to our mayor. We have our youth council. We present some ideas. We say to him, um, we can maybe have acquired some funding. We'd like to try one for an example to see if it works. Um, and that's the way we kind of work it um, in our city. Uh, if we go in with the strong hand and say, hey, this needs to be changed, they're going to mm -hmm. say, okay, go to the, you know, go wait inside. Somebody will be with you in a minute. And um, <laughs> we, we, you know, that that's not how we want it to be. Yeah. And, and I will say that the amount of changes that we've made in Elizabeth was because of the relationship we have with the mayor and the politics yeah. and the city council. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's difficult to navigate at some points, um, especially from mm -hmm. people who are activists. But you do get more um, flies with honey, as I found out. So uh, we we try to take that approach and use that approach um, mm -hmm. more, and it's benefited us tremendously. So yeah, really building that relationship, uh, and I'm sure that it's a constant. Uh, something you have to constantly pay attention mm -hmm. to, right? I mean, there oh. may be changes in city council and such. So it's interesting because when you say, I mean, both of you with your examples about, well, sort of da data-driven decision-making, but it's also not just the maps and the numbers, but it really is kind of this community-informed, yes. I mean, you know, the neighborhood intelligence really in, in yeah. insight that kind of makes the data and the numbers uh, come to Absolutely. life. Absolutely. It's a human relationship. And I'm actually a big believer that 
maps are not really super useful by themselves. They're not a super useful tool. Data is really not a super useful tool. It's connecting it to the lived experience that's really useful. Um, so if I say to you like, hey, it's really hot here, that's one thing. If I tell you that the um, Northeastern District in New Bedford has a land surface temperature of 111 degrees in the summer, you would say, whoa, that's, that, that's sort of a big deal. If I tell you about how that's impacted another human being and gosh, this sent me to the hospital as a person who has respiratory issues or something like that, that that's an added layer. When we were going around and doing um, door knocking, because we, we, we chat with people a lot to understand their climate concerns and you know, in the before times and now again are doing a lot of door knocking and heard from this woman uh, in Rhode Island. And we were talking to her about heat, you know, how is heat bothering you? And, you know, what would you like to see change to your block? And one of the things, I, this will always stick with me, she said, um, you know, I, I used to walk my dog around lunchtime, but now I've had to move his walks up to about 11 in the morning or after three because the pavement gets so hot that it actually burns his paws. So being able to connect that to some data and then the data to an intervention, that, that's, that's the full circle of it is connecting mm -hmm. it to the human experience. Great. So one quick question and then we shall sort of transition to our uh, closing, but in the efforts that you've shared with us, have there been some specific changes in, we'll just say, how the local government, how the community does community engagement? Like they've sort of seen, oh, like Groundwork is doing in this way, and you've seen, you know, other organizations or the local government start to model some of the, you know, community engagement strategies that you all have pioneered. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And a number of our trusts have actually become sort of de facto community engagement wings for the uh, local government um, because they see that, you know, I, one of the things that I always joke about, and it's it's real, no offense to the planners on the call, but I feel like people tend to hold these meetings that are like 10 a.m. on a Tuesday uh, where you're really not going to get people to come, but it's, it's really hard to know what else can you do? Are you welcome in different spaces? How do you make sure that your contacts are meaningful with people? And I think through modeling, getting people where they are, you know, setting up a table outside the subway station, you know, going door to door like Groundwork Elizabeth did to check in, make sure that people are okay, talk to them and, and, and have a um, relationship that's not transactional, but in is one that's uh, based on human concern and human connection, um, that they see that there are different ways to, to do that type of work. So uh, one example is in, um, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, our um, trust, Groundwork Ohio River Valley, uh, they are working with the city of Cincinnati to help them do community outreach and engagement around the development of their uh, first green and, and, and climate readiness plan. Um, something similar is happening in Yonkers, New York, where Grammar Cuts and Valley is um, working really closely with the city to help gather resident information and priorities. So, so in each one of these um, communities, we our, our relationship to everyone is very valuable. I, mm -hmm. I can't say broad coalition enough, like our relationship and our priority are always the people and the residents in the community, but we have to have close relationships with the government. We have to have close relationships with the private sector or none of this is getting done. Right, well, and again, that sort of goes back to the opening, which is this pivotal role of intermediaries where you're providing the local government with this kind of community engagement and civic capacity and yet, you know, again, trying to also expand the capacity of residents and the youth, both on the technical side, like, hey, this is what greening is about, but also empowering them uh, and elevating their voice. So um, Kate and John, my hat is tipped off to you for doing a fantastic job. We just covered such a range of those great strategies on the ground. So with that, I will pass it over to Jesse Grogan with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you guys. That was fantastic. Joe, John, especially John for uh, joining us while sick and Kate, that was really uh, informative and inspiring. So we appreciate everything you shared with us. Um, for those who didn't see in the Q&A, the question was asked about whether a recording of this will be available and the answer is yes. It will be posted on the Lincoln Institute's YouTube page and also on the event page for this event. So within about 48 hours or so, we should have a recording available for you if you want to go back and re-listen to absorb some more strategies or share it with your colleagues or students, that would be an option. The final thing uh, before we leave you for the day, I want to flag for you our next and final planned webinar in the series, which is coming up on May 16th at the same time, 12 to 1.30. This event will be uh, moderated by Gabby Velasco at the Urban Institute as well.
well, and it will really be a focus on what we can learn from the City of Providence, Rhode Island's Racial and Environmental Justice Commission and Climate Justice Plan. Oh, that's a mouthful and sounds like a city plan. <laughs> um, so they're going to go deep on how different avenues like planning and public health and different actors can be activated in different ways to support the fight for local climate justice, how to sustain community engagement in city programs, and how to shift sustainability priorities so that all of the city's work is responding to the environmental and climate justice needs that the city faces. As Joe mentioned in the very beginning, we're sort of helping the hoping that we can help more cities reach this third generation sustainability and providence is a great example of a mid-sized legacy city that has done just that so we'll have uh, leah bamberger who is the executive director of the northeastern university climate justice and sustainability hub and the former director of sustainability for the city of providence to talk about her, pro her program and what we've learned again that will be on may 16th from 12 to 1.30, and you can register at the link in the chat. Thank you all so much, and enjoy the rest of your day.